pretty excited to have Mike Russo join us because uh, Minnesota Wild are, you know, they're they're sneaky good. And I think the the hockey world's starting to realize that uh, this is a legitimate Stanley Cup contender. I love the uh, the quote from Kevin Fiala on the weekend about, hey, if they're contenders, we're contenders. There's so much to get to. Uh, let's bring them in. Mike Russo uh, on the Athletic Hockey Show on this Monday. How are we doing today, Mike? I'm doing great. How are you guys? Hey, fantastic. Fantastic. I love you guys. I'm just You're excited that I'm going to be coming to both your neck of the woods in the next week or so. So yeah. it's pretty fun. Yeah. Welcome back to uh, to Canada. We're uh, we're excited to, excited to have you. And, uh, you know, when the Wild come to Ottawa, we actually get some fans back in the building. So this is going to be it's going to be pretty exciting. Yeah. yeah, no, I can't wait. Oh, the Wild go to Winnipeg on Wednesday, and it's going to be 100% capacity. And uh, <laughs> a little different than the, than what they were playing in last week when they were there, and there was, like, nobody in the building. I think, it was, I think they said it was 50%, but it didn't look that much. Yeah. Actually, I'm looking at the schedule now. Uh, unless I have it wrong here, you, I might not be able to see you until the 19th in April. Damn. Really? Why? Because I'm in Montreal. I'm not oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, that's true. And I, honestly, that might be a one-off game where I don't even go to. Um, yeah, mm, uh, and I, feel, I don't even get. I, oh man, yeah, that know. sucks. We'll oh. figure it out. Uh, maybe, maybe I will go. I don't know. Uh, there was. I have a conflict uh, personally for that game, so I might have to cover it virtually. But we'll see. Also, common misconception uh, to be thought of as a Toronto person that has happened to me many a time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's all of us. We all get. Uh, they all figure we live in. Uh, in Toronto, but hey, uh, Mike. Before we talk about the Wild, and I, look, I, I, I really want to hit on your column that uh, dropped on Monday because I think Minnesota and Bill Guerin have some really important decisions to make in the next month. But look, listen, you unfortunately got into the news cycle last week, and it's not a thing that reporters necessarily crave. Like you don't, you didn't want to be part. I know you didn't want to be part of it. You didn't want to have your name dropped on a national telecast, and all of a sudden there was quite a, a frenzy around it. Can you, can you maybe just walk us through? Um, I know you addressed this on Twitter, but just maybe walk us through what what last week was like for you. Yeah, it was it was not, you know as you mentioned, Ian, it was uh, it was uh, super uncomfortable. Still not exactly over it, you know. I mean, in a lot of ways, you know, um, I I, I um, you know I thought I was beyond it, but I'm definitely not. I I I had trouble sleeping here the last two or three nights. Woke up a couple times, almost like anxiety attacks i was able to get sleep last night but uh honestly like dream, dreamed about it all night and all that type of stuff and so yeah um luckily i didn't uh and what you're referring to obviously is is anson carter dropping my name on on um national tv um basically um you know a real what i thought minor um difference of opinion on twitter where he uh called into question the wild's depth on a national telecast. And what happened is that wild fans sort of lost, um, you know, uh, disagreed obviously and started coincidentally, it was game 41 that the wild were on the Chicago, uh, playing the Chicago Blackhawks on, on TNT. And I wrote a mid season report that Jake Leonard, my editor actually pretty much edited during the day. And in that, um, I had a, just one line that said the wild comma, you know, one of the deepest teams in the NHL. And he called into the question the Wild's depth, and Wild fans screen captured that snippet of the column and kept on, you know, peppering him with the picture of of the fact that one of the reporters happened to call him that that day. So he came out with a tweet where he basically, you know, you know, brought up Minnesota Wild fans and reporters with a laughing emoji and brought up the Winter Classic where the Wild were absolutely rolled. And I just corrected him and I said, "Look, you know, I have a lot of respect for you, but the Wild are nine zero and one since then. A lot of." Uh, with a lot of the guys that you've pretty much mentioned. I mean, the wild are nine, three and one in their last 12. And in that time have missed Dumba two or three, uh, three times Spurgeon, seven times Brodine seven times. So I was just basically saying that, look, the one night that they were on your telecast, they were absolutely rocked. It was their first game in 12 days, but since then they're nine Oh and one sometimes without nine or eight players in their lineup. That's a team that's deep. And so I, what I did say was, you know, maybe you should listen to the the fans and the reporters that watch them regularly rather than laugh at them. And he obviously was stewing over that. He replied to the tweet. I never mentioned it again. And then obviously Anson went on the air and insinuated that uh, that it was a racial thing that I brought up that, uh, you know, I mean, he, he said it sounds awfully white that I'm the authority and don't say this in this month, meaning Black History Month. And uh, we know what is happening here and stay on code. And um, that is absolutely not me. It was a mortifying situation to be in. 
It scares me if he had said that about another reporter that's not as well known as me, because luckily I've covered this league for 27 years and I've earned reputation. And um, it's not often that you could be dubbed a racist on national TV and actually win the, the public support. And uh, thankfully, um, people from the hockey world came to my defense. Um, all Wild fans came to my defense. And I got a lot of heartfelt apologies um, from everybody on that panel. And uh, Ants and I had a, did have a good talk. Um, you know, I still thought that he was going to publicly apologize. That obviously never happened. Um, I sent off an email to TNT asking where that apology was and why they never reached out to me. And the email I got back from them was absolutely shameful. Um, I don't want to get into it, but I've lost a ton of respect for that network um, and the PR person that clearly copied and pasted a lawyerized uh, letter to me. And um that that letter that I got two days ago, um, that email that I got from them two days ago, I'll I'll absolutely never forget. Um, you know, as as long as I live, uh, you know, just the lack of support that uh, that TNT showed here, and and in my eyes, condoning what Anson said. So um, I I do mean from the bottom of my heart that you know, in my eyes, Anson and I are fine, um, and I appreciate that he reached out to me and we had a good conversation. Um, but, um, you know, I still feel like a lot of stuff publicly wasn't done from them. And, and just thankfully, this is, I think, behind me because, you know, you wake up that morning, Ian and Julian, and you know that we, you know, we're just signed to the New York Times or b bought by the New York Times. They have no idea who I am. And so it was a scary morning that day. I have a lot of uh, extra stuff that I do. And I just didn't know where this was going to go. You know, you're on national TV, essentially called a racist. Um, you know, I, I didn't know if I was going to lose my job, if I was going to lose freelance stuff that I do, if I was not going to be on, you know, radio anymore, TV, podcast, whatever. I didn't know where it was going to go. And, and um, you know, I'm just amazed that that stuff could be said publicly on national TV and, and nothing. There's no repercussions from it. And, um, you know, that that that's a little frightening to me. Wow. Um, I guess the only thing I can really say on on this, and, and we really appreciate you speaking about it, uh, and we will get to. Uh, more important stuff with the Minnesota Wild. Um, I, I'm just wondering if you maybe have thought about the one thing about your tweet that I think I think stewed with Anson the most. I guess is the fact that you might have insinuated that he doesn't watch games, and I, I think that's what I think that's what sat with him the most. Maybe maybe in hindsight, do you regret at least saying that part and what you initially said? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll just say I do, and I apologize to him profusely for that um, a thousand times on that phone call. Um, you know, um, to me, the context was, an, you know, your typical beat writer, national broadcaster point where they just watch things from a surface point of view. And, um, and you know, in my eyes, when you're doing a game on TNT, you're just paying attention to the game that night that is on your telecast. And so that was the context of what I said. I do regret saying that um, because I obviously don't think that Anson doesn't watch other hockey games and, you know, doesn't do his homework and and talk to people. Um, so that that is absolutely what I said. Um, but to me, what I put um, was completely uh, benign. And I think what it did do is sort of create other you know fans replying to him and, and insinuating that he was lazy or, or unqualified and things like that. And that obviously is not something that uh, I meant at all. Um, you know, I've gotten a ton of I don't want to start naming names, um, you know, but I've gotten a ton of support. Um, from from players that I've covered and and players throughout the league um, that that you know uh, that you know know me and know my heart and know my character um, you know it means everything in the world that guy is you know one name I will mention because I'll never forget it as long as I live is Matt Dumbo he pulled me aside and uh, a day after this happened when I probably really needed it from somebody like him and he pulled me aside and really gave me an incredible pep talk um, and. Um, I'll never forget that as, as long as I live. And, and the, um, that was just one of, you know, 100 or 200 calls that I've gotten and texts I've gotten in terms of support from not just colleagues of ours, Julian and, and people, you know, at the athletic and sports writing and sports media, but, you know, people in the game and, and uh, league headquarters and things like that. And and, um, and and that really, you know, in a lot of ways warmed my heart. But you're no, no doubt, Julian, you know, I've learned a lesson here as well. Um, you know, and, and I, you know, I've apologized to Anson to that, you know, uh, a gazillion times. Well, I think that, you know, what happened, I think was really unfortunate for you. And I, and you shouldn't have to go through that if, if you're, I, I believe that you are well-intentioned in everything that happened. And I guess I don't want to put words in Anson's mouth. I, 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 I saw the way that he reacted. And I wonder if it came from a place where maybe 
he's had those comments in no the doubt. past suggesting that he's not good at what he's doing. And maybe it comes from people who uh, will bring race into something like this yeah. and, and assume it's a lot darker than that. Uh, and unfortunately you ended up being a target of it and, and you should not go to that point if it's, if it's generally not the case, because the other side I worry about is if Anson Carter ever does that again and calls on race, then other people will look at him and be like, well, no, like you shouldn't be doing this. Look at what happened, what you did with Michael Russo and no one's going to believe you. Like I, as, as a, as a black person watching that scenario, like I, I know you're my colleague and I'm like, yeah, I, I don't believe you to be a bad person, but I also looked at Anson and I was like, okay, like what? It was a very uncomfortable thing to kind of just kind of see from a distance, if that makes any yeah. sense. But I'm really relieved that like you, your intentions were great with with Anson, or at least at least you, there were they were no intention of being racist or anything like that. Uh, but I also wonder for Anson's case what he's gone through in the past with that, and uh, if it's just that one particular comment just struck a nerve, essentially. And and I, I I definitely want to be respectful of the privacy of our conversation because uh, that was the one thing that Anson made very clear to me at the very beginning was that it was an off the record conversation. So I don't I I definitely don't want to say things that he said to me. But I will say that the one thing that he a hundred percent said and and what I've learned here is none of us know the shoes that other people have been through. And clearly, um, Anson throughout not just his hockey career as a player as a broadcaster, but his life has, has, uh, dealt with these connotations. Um, and it definitely triggered him. And, um, I think he sat on it for six days and it just kept on bothering him. Um, you know, just like it's probably still, you know, what's happened uh, in the aftermath has bothered me now for four or five days. So I could see where that happened. Um, and that is, that's, you know, to me, the unfortunate whole thing. And I, as I've told Anson, uh, next time I see him, I'd love to sit down and have a have a beer with them or coffee or whatever, um, and have this out because I've long respected for respected him. Um, you know, both as a broadcaster and as a player, I was, I was telling him the, on the phone that I remember, uh, I was trying to look for it, but the Star Tribune, my previous employer has, has an archive system that's very difficult to look stuff up. But for the story of when I was essentially trying to campaign for Doug Risebow to acquire him. Um, so I, I've long respected him. And so unfortunately, you know, where this probably went off the rails is after our little tweet exchange where I thought it was over and done with because I didn't even reply to his second tweet. Um, I probably should have just called him up and, um, and uh, you know, had that conversation. So I, I totally respect what you're saying, Julian. Yeah. And, and listen, Mike, well, we promised you we, we weren't going to uh, to focus on this, but I, I just think the way that you handled this with, with um, maturity and class uh, should be applauded. And, uh, you know, I think the you said it all when you said, you know, Anson and I are good. And I think that that to me, that says everything. And, and, and that that's all that matters. You and Anson are good. I think that 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 speaks volumes. I think all of us can can take a lesson in a very divisive time in, in both of our countries. Um, we could all take a little bit of a lesson of take a breath, have a meaningful conversation. Yeah accept some apologies and move on. And I think yep. you've done a wonderful job of that. Yep. And we follow each other on Twitter now, which he might, he might actually regret when he starts to see the <laughs> unnecessary <laughs> like play by play that I give during a wild game. He may be like, I cannot yeah. believe that I followed this guy to find out that Erickson Eck hit the post. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> well, so I'll tell I, you what, if, uh, if he was following you, he's probably saw your, uh, your tweet today all about, uh, what do the Minnesota Wild do at trade deadline time? And yeah. I know we're still just a, we're a month and a week, I think, right? Five weeks away from yeah, five uh, from weeks the, from today, five I weeks from today. So I, I think the Wild are such a curious team because they are legitimately, they've got Stanley Cup aspirations and rightfully so. And, and I think the question becomes, what should they do and what can they do? That was your column today. So why don't we, why don't we do this in kind of a podcast form? Let's put ourselves into Bill Guerin's shoes. What do the Wild do here in the next five weeks? It's a good question. I, I just saw the Tyler Toffoli uh, price, and now yeah. I'm wondering if they do anything. I mean, uh, I didn't see what the prospect is, but according to Drager, it was a first to fifth the prospect from Tyler Pitlick. I'm sure Tyler Pitlick has money going back. Um, you know, but I actually like Tyler as a player. But that's a that's a hefty price for Toffoli. I know that um, you know, uh, that obviously Brad Tree Living was looking for secondary scoring and things like that. Um, if you're looking at the Wild, a lot will depend on health and if they're still rolling in a month. Now, I have hard, I have it, you know, it would be hard for me to believe that they're not still rolling in a month if they're healthy because they have so many home games in March and they are so good at home. 
And, uh, you know, they're a nine-game homestand, and, and uh, I think they play 12 games next month. So if they're healthy, I think they're going to be rolling. But that actually might make him you – know, where a lot of Wild fans would be like, well, now go make that center to put you – get you that center to put you over the top. Go get a Giroux or Pavelski or whatever. I'm almost wondering if that would not make – Bill if that would – and and Pierre Lebrun, by the way, is going to have a Wednesday story this week where he talks to Bill Guerin. But I think that what Bill will probably convey in there is that if they're rolling, he's not going to want to disrupt the chemistry of this team. For me, if I was Billy, I would at least look at trying to get a Hurdle or a Pavelski if they're attainable. Just to at least see if they, if they that's somebody that you could put between Boldy and, and Fiala. Or, um, you know, maybe you put Hartman there and you move him between the new center between, um, you know, uh, um, obviously uh, Capri Safford and Zuccarello. Um, because if, if not now, when? When do you make that splash? Because in the next three years, they have so much money tied up in dead money for Parisian Suter that they're going to have to put a lot of entry-level guys on the contract. You're not going to be able to make these type of splashes at the deadline. And this is a team that right now will, um, to Anson's point, uh, have to play the St. Louis Blues probably in the first round. And St. Louis rolled them on the Winter Classic, and that wasn't an aberration. St. Louis has had their number for the last two years. Um, and then if you get by St. Louis, you're going to have to probably go through Colorado um, you know, to get to your, where you want to go to the conference final. So, uh, and we know that, you know, how deep they are up the middle between McKinnon and Kadri. And then you got Vegas as Jack Eichel. So this is a long, as good as the Wild are, this is a, still a quite a challenge to get to where they're going to want to go, and that's to win a Stanley Cup. So I just think it's something they should consider. But when I talk to, when I talk to people inside the organization, I get the impression that he doesn't want to give up his first-round pick and he doesn't want to give up a top, top prospect, even though, as Scott Wheeler wrote last week, the Wilds' prospect pool is as good as it's ever been. So, you know, to me, if I was that, I would say, all right, well, now there we have a couple guys that we could move that we are expendable because we have this guy and this guy and this guy coming as well. But I'm not sure that Bill Guerin's going to look at it that way. So, um, we'll see. Dallas still thinks they can make the playoffs. So, who knows if they're going to trade Pavelski? It sure feels like Claude Giroux is going to wind up in Colorado, um, and he hasn't played center anyway uh, for the last couple of years. He w- takes draws, but but he hasn't played a lot of center. And then Hurdle, it sure sounds like that they're at least talking to him about re-signing there. So those are really the only three big names out there right now. They're not trading Malkin in Pittsburgh. Um, so I don't, I don't, I, yeah, no, I, I just don't see um, really any other big names. So I think those are the only three that even make sense. I'm curious. Uh, well, I'll add this uh, to the Tyler Toffoli trade. I believe the, the prospect going the other way is a guy named Emil Heinemann, who I don't necessarily think was highly touted as a prospect, but could still be a solid player coming up, a big energy guy going forward for them. And also that first round pick that the Flames are going to give up on top of the fourth or fifth they're giving up in 2024. That first uh, is top 10 protected. And we all know how good the Flames are. It's probably going to be later in the first. I don't know if that does anything for Billy Guerin. Uh, but I, I do want to ask this one, and maybe that kind of gives a window into what they might do. I'm I'm curious with the fact that the Wild do have all those salaries to Parisi and Suter that are going to build up in, in terms of what they're allotted for salary years in and years out for the years to come. What does that do for the expectations for this team? Like, like it, 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 yes, they kind of have to be in a situation where they have to win now or else they're not really going to have that much room in the, in the coming years, right? Like, what does that do for the expectations for this team? Yeah, and, and that's another reason why I think this is sort of the year to, you know, try to win it all, um, you know, to go there. But I will say, because of the number of great prospects that this team has in the organization and the culture that they've built inside that locker room, especially with their leaders like like Spurgeon and Dumba and Felino, um, you know, and, and some of the really quality uh, up-and-coming players that they have. I mean, they just signed Jordan Greenway to a three-year deal at 24 years old. They have Felino that has added a ton to this organization. They have Hartman on a bargain deal. Um, you know, if all of a sudden you start adding um, a lot of these entry level guys from the minors, you know, Marco Rossi, Kalen Addison, I still think that this team over the next three years has built the ability to still be really, really good. They just might not be able to go out and make that big splash in free agency and things like that. And that's the decision that Bill Guerin and his staff made in the offseason when they made the surprising move to not only, you know, I think we all expected that something was going to give with Zach Parisi, but none of us expected that he would pull the band aid with both Brian Suter and Zach Parisi. So, I think, you know, Bill Guerin's expectations are gigantic, Julian. Um, there was a really hilarious video that they showed of their his first meeting inside that um, their trio rank in the in the lounge where he says to Jared Spurgeon, the captain, he goes, what are the expectations for this team? And Spurgeon goes to have fun and work hard or something. And 
and uh, and Bill, and Bill just goes f that. It's the win, and that has always been his um, his you know his expectation, and it's still his expectation. Even if he doesn't go out and swing for the fences by going out and getting a Giroux or a Pavelski or um, a Hurdle, I still he think I still think the reason why he wouldn't go out and give those prices is he truly believes that this team has something special brewing right now and can actually, if they're healthy, um, go make some noise in the playoffs. So we'll see if it has happens. But his you know his goal is to create long term success here, and I don't think he wants to do that by trading his first round pick and a bunch of prospects right now to go out and get a guy that he is, um, has no ability to re-sign in the offseason. And you know what? I, I think a big reason why the Wild and Bill Guerin might be in a position to be a buyer and a you know, legitimate Stanley Cup contender is Kirill Kaprizov. Just one of the most fun, electrifying, dynamic players in the game. Let's hear your case for Kirill Kaprizov Hart Trophy this season. Well, I think I think one big case, and this would be my same reasoning that I think Dean Evison should get, you know, big time votes for the coach of the year is I don't think anybody um, thought that this team would have the ability to be one of the top teams in the Western conference. And the standings look a little um, weird just because of the lack of games that a lot of teams have played compared to others. But the wild have consistently been the second best team in the Western conference, pretty much from the mid November Thanksgiving on, um, you know, th- uh, they're tied for third with the best points percentage in the league since Thanksgiving. Um, they're the second best points percentage by a mile, um, you know, in the Western Conference, uh, only because Colorado just keeps on winning and winning and winning. Um, and I think that a lot of that is due to guys like Kaprizov. I mean, Kaprizov has absolutely been a game changer in this organization. This team has been starved for a true superstar for as long as I've covered it. Um, you know, Marion Gabrick was the closest thing to it, but I still don't look at Marion Gabrick as a true star uh, when he played for this organization. Kirill Kaprizov absolutely is. Um, he's also a very unique star. He's the type of guy, he is as gritty as you can get. You know, last game, not only did he score just a gigantic goal in that game, but he's getting into goal mouth scrums. He's open height, uh, you know, not op- open ice hits, he's coming up bloody in, in battles. He's getting in roughing penalties. I mean, this guy, this guy takes care of himself. A couple of weeks ago in Boston, he gets run into the boards, hit from behind by Frederick. It looks like he broke his collarbone or, you know, AC joint or something. We hear really bad reports coming back to Minnesota that this guy was going to be out, you know, for several uh, for several games. And what happens? He misses one game and plays, and he's been absolutely on fire ever since. This, he's got points in fourteen of his last fifteen games. Um, he is to me, you know, I always say I am one of those people that say remind people the Hart Trophy definition is most valuable to his team. And I know you can make that you could take different players on different teams and make that case, but there is no doubt that Kirill Kaprizov is the most valuable player of this team. Without him, they would not be where they are. I, I want to follow up on that. I want to know what do you make of, of the national conversation and attention around a player like Kirill Kaprizov? Because in the limited time that we've seen from, out, of course, with the outsider perspectives that we have, like we see him in highlight clips that like Dmitry Filipovich might tweet out. And the way he skates, he just looks so dope, man. Like he genuinely looks like really cool. Like he's an awesome like player to just watch. And I bet the fans in Minnesota love him, but you, you of course being around the team and you of course paying attention to national coverage. What do you make of the people who talk about him and, and, and rate him and all that? Like, do you think he gets enough praise? Do you think he deserves more? How do you feel about him? I think he does. I, you know, I think that's what makes, I mean, I think that I am starting to hear a national attention. Like when I see him in the power rankings and um, you know, and, and as you mentioned, Julie, I mean, they are always talked about now the Minnesota wild as being a fun team to watch. When historically has that ever happened? I mean, I've covered this team for seventeen. Yeah, I mean, I've I've covered this team for seventeen years. The team's been around for twenty one, and I I would be the first to tell you that they're not a team that that should be on national TV or just you know they weren't a marketable team. Now they are, and it's not just Kaprizov. I mean, you know, I just did this uh, game story a couple games ago where I went down and talked to Nate Prosser, who used to play for this team. He's a former defenseman. He's somebody that uh, went to a, this game as a fan, to an NHL game as a fan for the first time since he was 14, 15 years old. And he was absolutely blown away by how everybody on the wild roster can skate. Um, they, this team has always been sort of a, this plodding team. But now, though, it's the one thing that Bill Guerin has done is he's made them younger and he's made them faster. 
And, you know, Kevin Fiala can fly. Zuccarello is having just a tremendous year, one of the big, best years of his entire career. Um, you know, they have a line in Greenway and Foligno and Erickson Eck that is unlike most lines in the National Hockey League in terms of size and speed and grit. And uh, they, um, you know, they, they can muck it up with the best of them. Uh, they haven't been scored on at even strength this season, which is just crazy if you think about it. Um, so that, to me, is what's pretty exciting about this team. But, but there's no doubt, as you just alluded to, Julian, that, that Kristoff stirs that drink. And he gives them this moxie that, um, you, that is palpable when you see it on the ice. They just follow him. They love him. He's this affable you know, kid that just you can see the love that he has um, for playing the sport every time he's out there. And he's just got this winning, winning demeanor. And um, it's pretty awesome to watch. He's as good a passer as he is a, a shooter. And his edge work, as you mentioned, Julian, when he gets that hip, those hips moving and he starts, you know, stick handling the puck, it's like very few guys in this league. And so, you know, he's, he doesn't have the straightaway speed as a McDavid or something like that, but his edge work is as good as most guys in the league. And, um, you know, probably right up there with, you know, from a forward standpoint, like McCarr, I mean, his edge work is just tremendous. Uh, McCarr is obviously a thoroughbred, but, but that's, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's fun to watch. I, I, you know, I covered Pavel Bure in Florida and Pavel every single night as a sports writer would take me out of my seat. I remember his first power play, his first breakaway goal that he ever had with the, with the uh, Florida Panthers. We were on Long Island. I covered the team for years and it was this muck and grind clutch and grab team. I don't even know in the first four or five years of covering the Florida Panthers if I ever even saw a player get a breakaway. And Robert Spella <laughs> hits Pavel Bure for a headman pass on uh, in, at Nassau Coliseum, and Bure skates in, and the back of his jersey is flop flying in the air, and he scores a breakaway goal. And honestly, I almost fell out of the press box in Nassau Coliseum because I just couldn't believe that I saw somebody in a Florida Panther uniform do that. And that's how I feel with Kaprizov as well. He just you watch him every shift, and his work ethic, his speed, his the scoring chances that he generates. Um, is is as good as I've seen in this league, uh, definitely in a Minnesota Wild uniform. And so it's pretty awesome. And then they have great, I mean, you know, that's I feel bad for guys like Kevin Fiala because I'll tell you what, he's on fire right now, 10 goals in his last 14 games. And it, it always feels, Julian, that he gets like the short shrift all the time because all we do is talk about Zuccarello and Kaprizov. Um, even the, these games where Fiala will score the most clutch goal, eventually Kaprizov will do something to win them the game and you just like wind up just, writing about Kaprizov, and you just feel like you're just not giving Fiala his just due. I'll, t- I'll tell you what. I, I grew up in Vancouver, and I was in high school when Pavel Bure broke into the league. Yep. And I have never seen anything like that. Like, I remember yeah. watching Pavel Bure, and then people would, like, when I grew up, people would tell me, like, oh, like, they, they watch Guy Lafleur, and you never saw anybody like Guy Lafleur. Pavel Bure was my Guy Lafleur. Like, that's yeah. the guy I tell people about, like, I grew up like you have no idea, and 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 I hope Kaprizov is that guy, and and maybe it'll be Trevor Zegers, but I I think there's yeah. there's lots of guys that can can kind of pull you out of your seat. Listen, we've kept you longer than than we said we would, so let me wrap with this question because Friday night we're getting a clash of the two teams that Michael Russo covered over the years. It's the yes. Panthers in the Wild. I need to know how special that would be if that's the Stanley Cup final. What does that mean to you? Uh, it'd be absolutely awesome. And, uh, you know, for multiple reasons, because, you know, I, I just, uh, Brunette, Andrew Brunette is his class of act as I've ever covered. In fact, I'm doing, I'm sitting down with him at, at, uh, his hotel on Thursday and doing a podcast, uh, with him for the athletic. So, uh, wild fans can look forward to that this, uh, this upcoming Thursday or it might come out Friday. We'll see. Um, but, um, it would be a blast. I mean, just to go back to my home to cover something like that, to get to finally, I've covered this league for 27 years, and you know all I want to do is cover a Stanley Cup run, right? Uh, no hockey writer wants to uh, pretty much go on vacation every year after the first round, and that's been my entire career. It feels like, and so um, that would be the blast. But you're right. I mean, it, you know, some fans have dubbed it the Russo Cup. Uh, that sounds a little pompous to say. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that, um, but it is pretty cool uh, if that would happen. I think it'd be great for Wild fans. You know, from a Wild fan standpoint, guys. I mean, th- this fan base deserves it. Um, they are such a passionate fan base that every single year they've got to watch other markets get to root on their teams in the, in a cup run. And this market just would give anything for that. I can only like, I have never heard XL energy center. This is perennially been a very quiet sold out crowd. And I think a lot of why I think it's like that in Toronto, Calgary, 
like places that like are super educated with sport, a lot of times they really just watch it. They watch it almost like a play, right? They talk about it. Like they don't like go there like Montreal, Julian, and where they just, you know, it's just fun, right? <laughs> at XL Energy Center this year, it is a fun place to be in a lot of ways because of guys like Fiala and Kaprizov. And I just think I can only imagine this building and the electricity that would be created if this market get to, got to cover, got to watch a uh, Stanley Cup run. So if it was Florida, it would be absolutely awesome. Uh, it would be just a real fun, fun time and definitely, uh, you know, be, I'd be like Andrew Whitworth. I might have to retire after it, right? Like, uh, oh, like, man. It get any better. Yeah. So. It, I love how it's the not the brunette cup. It's the Russo cup. I love yep, it. I exactly. love it. Exactly. Uh, yeah, it's always about me. I always yeah. say that. Anybody oh listen, there's going to be wild fans that listen to that last line and just like, just like yeah. chuckle because that's sort of my MO, right? It's always yeah. About me. 